Good morning, booktubies! <laughs> I feel like over the course of this you're gonna realize all that Rue just lives in this window seat. Um, anyway, it is the 29th in the morning, and I gave myself yesterday off of booktube prize obligations, <laughs> so this morning we are back at it, full speed ahead with book number three, My Fourth Time Lead Around by Sally Hayden. Uh, immediately right off the bat there's a ton of front matter, so I've read the front matter and the first chapter. Um, the front matter does a great job of contextualizing and setting the scene for the reader. Uh, there's a big prologue where she just talks about how she got involved and that um, she was a journalist who had previously shown in some of her short form stories a sympathy for refugees and as a result of that being out there in the world refugees found her and contacted her to share their plight and try to not necessarily get help from her but get the story out of what was happening to them. And so that's very much scene setting number one. And then we get a big timeline that gives us, I think, heavier weight on what was happening. And the seriousness of the story is that at the global level, through this timeline, we are being told or shown the fact that through political changes, this was effectively going on for about 10 years before anyone seriously investigated and it was declared crimes against humanity, what was happening there. Um, these people were effectively refugees traveling through Libya to escape to usually Europe. And as a result of, of all these political decisions, they were kicked back, in, entrapped in Libya, held in detention centers. And these detention centers are incredibly mistreating them, torturing them often to the point of death. And so that is a pretty big story to tell. And we're given that, that scope and information leading into this. So I think that helps a lot. Going into chapter one, we're getting her interaction with, with one particular refugee and the story of that individual experience. And it was wild to read that because it is so familiar from other stories that I've read about that experience. Um, specifically, I would say almost verbatim, it feels like the piece of the boat journey in What Strange Paradise by Omar el Akkad that I've read. It, it was so similar what happened, the experience that refugee went through, and kind of their, their having survived and come out of it um, was obviously hopeful, but we are also shown what is so difficult still for them, even after having survived through what should have been the darkest part of this experience. Uh, so I think all really great so far, and I'm looking forward to getting into it some more, but for now I've got to go do work. Rue had to settle for the chair because one side of his window seat got knocked, so I'm gonna have to clean the, the suction cup. <laughs> what a silly boy. Well, I feel like a dumb American. I just learned that Tripoli is the capital of Libya. Who knew? Uh, in my mind, those are not even remotely geographically in the same area. So, very educational so far, and <laughs> I'm not very far in. You can't tell, but it's actually only 3 p.m. It just got wildly dark and stormy, and there's the wind. I wish you could see the rain. Oh, there goes the power. Oh my gosh.
look. My grocery store had green plantains. So I'm going to make some delicious mofongo. <laughs> After the rain we got, it has been a hot couple days because the humidity finally kicked in as a result of that. So it's been utterly miserable here and very, very warm. Um, so I'm sweating and gross again. Um, I haven't checked in in a couple days. I was feeling really, really miserable. Um, I, think I, I think I threw my back out. When you get, when you get older, <laughs> like me, around middle age, you start having those random things like that for, where your back or neck gets hurt for no reason. Um, so. I was reading though, even though I didn't check in, and I did finish the fourth time we drowned um, by Sally Hayden. Now, this was very good, I think, but I, I'm struggling with what to take away that's actionable out of it. I don't, I don't know. I think that's maybe my one. Like I'm being very nitpicky and judgy here because I'm judging. So that's that's pretty much my my major critique is like, is this to impart empathy for readers who maybe don't know about refugees' plights. Like, I feel like this is all stuff that I know that I've read about before. Um, and I guess maybe another critique that I hate to say, but the first 200 pages feels a little repetitive, um, as horrible as that is, because uh, Hayden is taking us through almost each chapter. We're jumping to a different individual at a different detention center. And then there's a little bit about her and what she's doing at the time herself and kind of things going on politically and things that she's investigating and who she's getting in touch with. And so those parts are maybe 20% and the rest is, is this individual's account of their life at the detention center for the most part. And every one of those is, is horrific, but they all, they all sound so the same and familiar that the mass of humanity that's going through this trauma there in Libya is just so huge. And it does get that across because you're just going through a litany of repetition over the course of this story. And the fact that these are all happening at different times too. So you're seeing this has the scope and scale of this is given to you through, through that repetition. Um, but it does feel like you're hearing the same story because they're so similar. And I kept also coming back to something that, that comes up multiple times, both in comments that Hayden makes in the text, as well as what some of the individuals say themselves, that they're treated like animals or less than animals. And I had to think of uh, Tender is the Flesh by Augustina, Augustina Vastarica, yeah, um, the cannibalism book. And I don't know what specific situation she was trying to comment on with that book, but I, I have to assume it was something similar to this, where the, the mass inhumane treatment of people where they, they are treated as disposable and less than animals and just the horrors that people turn away from here are really made me think of that's probably very much like what she was trying to get across in Tender as the Flesh, um, that this is happening every day that we are treating humans like this throughout the world and what are we going to do about it? And I don't feel like I came out of this with, with much actionable stuff. Um, 
in terms of, of actionable stuff. Like I wish we had maybe more of a portrayal of what organizations are good because through so much of this book, it's telling us how even well-intentioned charitable organizations or, or NGOs are have to be flexible and often corrupt themselves in order to operate in these conditions, or they, they do for reasons unknown. Um, one, one specific example, for instance. Uh, so this aid organization that was, or not a specific aid organization, a, a bunch of aid organizations, basically what they have to do is kind of get accepted to provide aid to these detention centers. And in order to, to be that, that charity that, that gets selected, they kind of have to be flexible and work with the terrible people, the torturers who are running these detention centers and show them that they're going to be easy to work with. They're not going to make them change a lot. And that provides them an influx of money because refugee work is very lucrative because people's heartstrings are pulled by, by that. So they get this influx of money, but then they, they aren't pushing for, for actual major changes that will make the lives of these people better. Because in order to get that deal, they had to give up all of, all of their um, upholding of the rights of the people there. So yeah, yeah, so all of the charities that are talked about are making similar, you know, devil's bargains. And that's just very hard to read. Um, so I don't feel like I know what I can do to make it better. I think this would be great for, for giving people empathy about the situation, but I already have that in spades. Um, I, I think one of the things that was probably the most new information and heartbreaking for me was sort of hearing the plights of the children. Um, because I think the situation is obvious for, for any of us reading a book like this, that the trauma is, is damage that's unrepairable in a child, much less, or in an adult, much less a child. But for, for the children, it's that they don't have, get education. There's no access to toys or books or, or any way for them to learn things. And the things that they're absorbing there are are the horrors of their situation and the people in power being these these awful people is is very normalized so so they see like torture as a daily part of their life and just absorb it as that's that's the role of power and so very often they as they get older they turn to the side of these soldiers and torturers that are are running the, the thing and that's just so hard to read because you know, they talk about, you know, the children picking up phrases that these people will say or, or threatening to rape girls that are around just because it's so normalized to them. And they're just picking that up um, because their little minds are sponges and that, as well as, you know, even simple things like the fact that they're in warehouses and they don't see daylight for weeks or months at a time. So these kids are growing up in a dark, cramped space where they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't know when they're going to go outside. They don't know if they're ever going to be free. And that's all they've known their entire life. Um, you know, in, in cases of like babies born there, they may never go outside for years. And that is what they're surrounded with all of the time. It's just unbelievable. So I think that that's most of what I would want to say. I think this was very powerful and harrowing as a book. I think it. It shows great journalistic integrity throughout the course of this, what she is trying to get across. And the back half, I do feel, is much more hopeful. We get, um, after we're through that litany of examples, Hayden starts telling us more about um, kind of the progression of things, her going to court cases, um, maybe potentially charging people over this, um, being involved more with, with politics, not, not involved in politics, but observing and reporting on, on political moves surrounding this. Um, and kind of putting putting people to questions about their misdeeds and their abdication of their duty in the past. Uh, so we get more of that, but more importantly, we get stories of people who made it out that she talked to earlier. And the hardest part of that is that as we're hearing from the people who got out, they're all kind of unsatisfied. And so while it's hopeful that we are hearing from all of these people that have, have gotten out, have actually reached their, their destination, they've gotten to Europe somewhere, so many of them have have such baggage of trauma and they're faced with being being foreign um facing xenophobia or anti-refugee sentiments pretty much anywhere they go and so they wind up disillusioned about the whole situation because of the fact that 
you know, they, they have this, this thing they can't get over and they can not really belong anywhere as a result. And that's kind of what they were searching for. They were looking for safety and belonging. And even when they get the safety, they still don't feel like they have the belonging because so few other people can, can relate to the experience they went through. And they're just never going to get over it. So, so really, really hard stuff. Um, really well written. Um, yeah, very, very compelling to read. And I, I really recommend this one. So I think it's been a great first three books. Tomorrow is an off day for work because it's the holiday in the US. So I don't know what I'm going to do yet, whether I'm going to take it as a break day from Booktube Prize reading or try to get a boost in my reading by reading a bunch tomorrow. But we will see. We, you and I will see together in the next clip. I thought I was going to start reading, but I guess I was clearly wrong. Thanks, Rue. I've not really read a lot. This week has been an utter disaster for me. Um, just complete chaos in many areas. So we're going to put that aside, but catch up on where I'm at. I don't think I've updated you in, in several days. I'm just not feeling up to it. I did continue reading, but barely, I mean, for, for me anyway. I was a little, like, slightly behind. Now I'm very decidedly behind on my Booktube Prize reading. I, the 60 pages I read this week was all from this, and that's everything that I read. Um, I did do, like, two hours of audiobook and lost my audiobook that I had. So I wasn't intending to be reading both of the war books for Booktube Prize, but I have picked up my Booktube Prize book that was available on audio, The Face Maker by Lindsay Fitzharris, which is also about war. And... So, so I'm going to be concurrently reading the two. I have not started it yet, but I've got uh, my D&D game is today, and that is a, a good haul of a drive. It's like 40 minutes each way. So I will be doing that today. Um, as far as I've gotten in this so far in Half American, um, it's very interesting. It's odd for me in this set of books so far, because we don't seem to be establishing, like, a cast of, of people that we're following. Sorry, Rue is on the cat wheel, so if he gets going, it's going to be loud. Um, so we're, we aren't really establishing individuals that we're following. It just seems to be following a timeline of leading up to the U.S. entering the war. And that's interesting because we, we do get individual stories. Like, we, we focus in on a person's experience, and once that anecdote is done, we just kind of move on. It's very much more focused broadly on telling the wider experience of black soldiers than than a single individual. It's covering that from personal experiences, from these sort of negative things they've been through, from the, the war effort, really um, pushing for them to to join and, and arguing that they are vital while also at the same time having large swaths of the American population be completely against them and um, at times actively fighting violently against them on our own soil. Uh, which is crazy. I, I don't think I've ever heard about that before. Um, it's unsurprising to me, but, but very obviously that's occurring primarily in the South. These black soldiers are being, you know, stationed there and <laughs> all of a sudden facing these massive backlashes. And it, yeah, it's just wild to see the stories there. Um, 
I think that that it's interesting because we are getting both the at home and abroad story of this as well. And one of the things that came up was, you know, kind of a prominent figure discussing the fact that that he felt like he was treated more with more equality overseas than at home. And, and that's just a really interesting sentiment. So this is super harrowing. Though. <laughs> um, there's some really, really hard reading in here. And so I think this is, I mean, coming off of Fourth Time We Drowned, I thought that was very difficult, but so far this immediately has been, has been even harder to read. But I think it's very important stuff. So I'm, I'm really glad to be reading this already in the short little bit I'm in. Um, I think this is also one of the shorter books and it's doing an effective use of, of its length already. It's very quick chapters, really getting into the depth and, and having a strong narrative to that timeline that it's going through. So. So very good stuff so far. What do you make when you don't feel like cooking? I, I have been super into sweet potatoes and I got a whole bag at Aldi. So we got two big sweet potatoes with a little smoked paprika, salt, pepper, and jarred uh, artichoke hearts. So it doesn't look too appetizing, but I'm super into it. Let's update first on the face maker. Um, so initial impressions because I started it in the car yesterday and I got about two hours through. Um, initial impressions are that interesting topic. I'm assuming we are setting up some some of the doctors or a doctor at least that is involved but overwhelmingly what the the book is getting across so far in the first chunk is just how gruesome war was. Um, we kind of get a litany of depictions of the horrors of war, the the plight of the disfigured, like how prominent disfigurement was at the time, and that people who were disfigured were so horribly mistreated. Um, at one point somebody quoted was saying that disfigurement was viewed as literally worse than death because people's families wouldn't accept them back. Um, they were treated as subhuman very much. And so, so we're building a case, I guess, for why this was such a big deal to have somebody start making inroads into treatment for disfigurements. Um, and I mean, there's just so much, so much graphic, awful stuff. So if you are squeamish at all, uh, this, this book would be a really difficult book for you. Like, like something that's not too graphic, but is horrible that I didn't even, I, I don't think I've ever heard this before, but it's talked about how they, they literally just to keep things moving they would fill in roads or, or, or trails with bodies like people horses whatever just to, to fill in and so they were just driving over dead bodies piles of rotting dead bodies um and talking about the smell like the smell is described a lot so this one is a, the most gruesome of the books that i've read in terms of very graphic descriptions and we've had some pretty gruesome stuff in multiple books so far um, so that ultimately I don't find I have a hard time with it but I think it's gonna be hard for a lot of people um, I think just at the point where I was winding down we were starting to get uh, someone who who clearly has an interest in trying to address these problems so so we were just kind of getting into the actual plastic surgery part I think uh, then uh, the, the other book so I got halfway through half American yesterday uh, to about 150 pages in and um, I think it continued to be mostly more of the same, uh, but tensions were, were really ramping up based on the, the very segregated nature of the military, the way that the black soldiers were being treated that I've talked about before. And this morning I started with a chapter on race riots and lynchings. And um, I pretty much cried through the whole ch chapter, I think, at least in part. I'm just having a, a difficult week and so a little emotionally heightened. but. Yeah, it was really hard reading, um, and I'm getting emotional just talking about it. Um, like it was, it was very difficult reading. It wasn't a super long chapter, so I, I pretty much just finished that chapter. Um, and it's so hard to read through that and look back at just the dehumanization. Having read previously the book A White Too Long, that book talked about things like how entire churches or communities would 
li literally like walk out of church to a lynching and have a picnic there. The whole family and children there and would be treating it as a celebration and commemorate it with, with postcards they would show, display at their home, things like that, with graphic depictions of, of dead bodies and stuff like that, or taking body parts as souvenirs. And this, this talks much more about that later on in the chapter, talks about the horrors of the, the unequal treatment by the police um, in conflicts during these sort of race riots that sprung up. It was just awful. It's just so painful to read. Um, but the chapter did end with some level of hope in that the army started finally trying to address this by doing widespread sort of re-education training for the white soldiers and officers. I mean, in points literally just trying to impart that the black soldiers are people and they should they should be treated as other soldiers. Um, so that that makes me hopeful that we're into the turning point where we're gonna see some some progress here. <laughs> but man, that was a really hard chapter to read. Um, yeah, so this is the first book to actually make me cry <laughs> in this in this process, and there has been some very heavy reading so far. So, so yeah. Um, but I am planning to mostly focus on half American today. Um, so hoping for for more good progress on this one. This is gonna be such a boring vlog because for these two, because I'm just really trying to push forward and not get behind in my reading. So you're gonna see a lot of me in the chair with the cats behind me. <laughs> but I will probably update later today. I think there's probably a nap in my future, and that's about it. <laughs> but I will check in later. Oh, heartbreak. The eggs were here yesterday and today they are gone. I think uh, some sort of raptor probably got them because I saw, I saw some large bird swooping by and Rue was being upset at it through the window. Um, I did see the birds, the two little birds that the nest belongs to, I think. So I think they're fine, but their, their eggs got taken. So sad after all their hard work. Oh good, I'm happy they're still both alive. White politicians across the South vowed to resist any attempts to extend democracy to black Americans. The South, at all costs, will maintain the rule of white supremacy, declared Louisiana Senator John H. Overton. Southerners will not allow matters peculiar to us to be determined by those who do not know and do not understand our problem. Florida Senator Claude Pepper said the South will allow nothing to impair white supremacy. Senator Ellison, Cotton Ed Smith of South Carolina, challenged to all those who love South Carolina and the white man's rule to rally in, the, in this hour to save her from a disastrous fate. Wow. Uh, so this is just after uh, the Smith v. Allwright Supreme Court ruling saying that uh, state primaries could not disallow black voting. And everybody was up in arms. And it feels so very familiar to things happening right now. Man, oh man, <laughs> do you want to feel the outrage? Ugh, so frustrating. As promised, it's evening, and I made progress on Half American. I'm up to page 228, so very good progress. And as you should have seen in that previous clip, things shifted more focus on politics and policy from around page 150 into 200, definitely. Um, with that, that quote that I read off, you will have heard about Supreme Court rulings, which is very timely considering what's going on in the U.S. today, a lot of conflicts surrounding the Supreme Court, and especially the double V for victory pushes for equality from the North, um, and double V for victory was this sort of political ideology, um, and it was a groundswell movement toward equality at home, desegregation, and the, the actual war abroad. So two victories is what they were sort of going for with that. And so that's a concept that I was familiar with before, but a lot of broad strokes. This definitely gets much more into minutia than I was aware of before, and some really important actions by the NAACP. So NAACP was, was very wrapped up in that from the, the grassroots level. Um, then once we kind of got beyond that toward, toward the later end of this section, it started going into increasing protests because we're beyond the beginning of the war. This is, I think I mentioned early on that it seems to be being told very linearly. Uh, we're into the actual progression of war. We're past the beginning where um, conflict about expectations has already happened. And now the soldiers are, are kind of getting fed up um, with what's being placed on them and mistreatment um, unjust and unfair treatment, and the protests are increasing, not just 
from soldiers who don't want to continue to be underestimated and um, un untrained and overworked in many cases. Uh, so they're, they're pushing back against that, but also students and young people are starting to form into these grassroots, grassroots movements that the NAACP is, is really bolstering to fight for this, this double V for victory at home. And so seeing all of that culminate and the sort of the progressive ideologies that are, are swirling around at that time is very cool. And it's, it's giving me such a, I don't, I don't know how to express it, such a more granular um, understanding of what was going on throughout the country because we're looking at so many different places um, as well as what was going on with these, these soldiers in terms of their hearts and minds abroad and how that was affecting things at home here in the US. So this has been really, really fascinating. Um, I, I definitely kind of underestimated this book and how much it was going to be um, compelling me to read. So really, really great chunk of reading today, I think. I think this was this was phenomenal. Who I am a disaster right now, but um, I'm running around like a crazy person in I'm in my home office. You can see there's the, the book wall that you guys see sometimes. Um, so I'm getting all of the stuff cleaned up because I got a call for a foster. I've been waiting for a while and haven't gotten one because everybody snatches them up so quickly. Uh, so <laughs> they're having a mass spay day today. And uh, so they need to get everyone that has surgery out for nice restful recovery for a week. And so I'll only have a short term foster for a little bit for this kitty. I'm getting an adult. All of the kittens already got grabbed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm getting everything cleaned, got to wash all, all anything cloth and clean the floor and make sure it's set up nice and, and safe so my cats can't get in, all of that stuff. So I'm um, taking care of all of that, getting uh, fell away plugged in so it'll have accumulated in here a little bit, but very exciting. So we will see um, who I get. I, I think um, she's supposed to be very sweet and cuddly. So hopefully we'll see some cuddly kittiness. Oh, poor baby. Is everything awful? I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're very drugged. It's not very good, is it? It's okay, you can just lay down. There you go, that's nice. What a good girl, Monroe. And she finally got comfortable after a few minutes of rallying at herself. My word. I just read a section where it was talking about how, um, in this circumstance, these a troop of white soldiers were allowing German, uh, obviously also white German soldiers who were prisoners of war, into the mess halls and on vehicles and transports with them themselves, and they wouldn't allow the black soldiers on their own side. just like insult to injury after reading multiple sections where you know the, the same black soldiers were doing a lot of really heroic actions in spite of being considered untrained and treated as if they're they're stupid and can't learn and don't work hard underestimated constantly even though they were outperforming yeah man this is a frustrating book have been to Aldi you know they have the weirdest and also best seasonal items that only stay for a little while. These are amazing. Oh so violent. Wow. Did you defeated it? So wrapping up Half American by Matthew F. Delmont, now that I've read it, this was not what I expected. I, I really thought this was much more military history, and it, it is that, but it's way more focused on socio-political commentary and, and information, and I leaned way more into that than I, I had expected. This was really great. I think people would very much benefit from picking, picking this up, and this is one of the shorter books, I think the shortest actually, of my books in this round of the Book Two Prize. So. It seems very palatable to, to give out to people. 
the main the main challenge here is that this is really harrowing because we're alternating over the course of the book between personal individual accounts of, of very negative experiences of these soldiers and the politics and policy that were applied and we don't really get the hopeful side or even the progress so for me personally looking back at you know the 40 years after this happened to when i was born uh, that the progress there i can see even the, the 40 years since i was born to current uh i can see even more progress so so thinking from my own personal lens, lens and applying my personal lens i see a ton of progress but that's not in the book in the book we basically see start to finish of the war really and seeing the soldiers coming home is really awful at the end of the book um, we're seeing all the negatives that happen for them. And what I, I would have liked is to see more of that, how we've progressed. Um, there were steps beginning, and I think the beginnings are what this book is trying to get across. And in the conclusion, we also see how detrimental the long-term effects of the treatment of these soldiers have been generationally. And I wish that had been expanded a lot more. Um, that was really like, it felt like we could have had another hundred pages just from the topics included in the conclusion that had not been explored at all through the book prior. So I do actually wish that this hadn't been the shortest book. I, I could have definitely gone for this being twice as long, honestly. But I do think that because it's relatively short and compact, it's really tightly written, that you could kind of hand this to someone as a starter and get them into the topic and, and as a diving off point to jump into this. Um, this feels so timely because there are many things that I can see that people are attempting to roll back or push back against politically in the US currently. Um, it feels like this is exactly the history that, that particularly the South is trying to erase. And there's so much hard hitting in here that, that just was a gut punch for me. Um, to see just blatant white supremacy that I hope in many cases is not present anymore, but I can see echoes of still or even growing in our country in the US. So that was that was painful to read. Um, I think this is the kind of condemning at the national level type of topic that that we kind of all need to be exposed to a lot, lot more. Um, so so I don't want to ramble on about this one, but this was very unexpected for me. I think this was the biggest surprise so far. I've only got a couple more books to read, but this was a really big surprise and I thought this was just fantastic. Um, it was really hard to read, especially Supreme Court cases with what's going on in the US now. And and I think that's been an interesting aspect of, of my readings currently for the BookTube Prize because all of them seem to have little moments that really tie into things going on in the world right now. So uh, I think that's it for, for Half American for now. Um, I think if you, you will have seen Hopefully last night I did make some progress on the face maker as well. And that one is a little bit slow to start because the topic is supposed to be this individual surgeon, but it took a really long time to get to the introduction of that surgeon into the narrative. And before that, it's just a litany of very gruesome information. So um, I've kind of gotten through that gruesome information and now I'm starting to see the, the early sort of inception of plastic surgery has, has begun. We, we got introduced to that surgeon and now have heard sort of what he did, what inspired him and the people that he connected with. And so that's still very early days at about like the, the 30 to 40% mark. So, so I'm going through that very quickly. It's only eight hours on audio. So that should be easily finishable this week if I focus on it. So that is, that's where my brain is at currently for my BookTube Prize reading. Good morning again. I feel like there's a lot of morning updates to this, but I started book number six, Eating to Extinction, The World's Rarest Foods and Why We Need to Save Them by Dan Saladino. And uh, I just got started into this, but it's, it's a chunky one. So we're hopefully going to make some good progress on it today. It's Saturday. So lots of reading time, hopefully. And this one started out exactly like I expected in the intro, talking about the needs for biodiversity, the lack of biodiversity that we have created um, as humans. And also tying into environmental impacts, impacts to us individually, and the risks of lack of biodiversity. So I think that's that's very good. But jumping into the first section, which seems to be wild foods, or a bunch of different sections on different topics. So I think uh, this is going to be a lot more informative and interesting than I thought than just talking about the plants. It seems to have a very heavy emphasis on 
sort of the social and cultural aspects. Um, so the first two chapters, which are very short chapters, is good because the information and the text is, is quite densely packed. So these two short chapters cover different indigenous food heritages. And so it talks about both the history and what's happening today, as well as kind of how the Western world really heavily affected um, and negatively uh, these indigenous food sources. So that was was great so far. So really excited about this, even more than I was expecting. This is already a topic that I'm very interested in. And yeah, with adding in the social and cultural aspects, big thumbs up for me. So looking forward to reading more today. Hello. Oh, you want to say hi? How nice. And time for another ridiculously easy dinner tonight. I have not been feeling great, so I haven't been feeling like cooking a lot. There's been a lot of protein shakes. So this was nice because I could just throw salmon and asparagus into a Pyrex container in the oven and be done. I just love finding things in library books or secondhand books, don't you? This person went to the Panda Express and got a panda bowl with double super greens a uh, honey walnut shrimp and a drink very exciting and apparently they uh they gave up at the soybean i have made good progress on eating to extinction this weekend and i'm about a fourth of the way through i've completed i think the plant parts so there are sort of sections chapters with short bits on each plant and the plants are in groups of wild gathered plants, uh, cereals, and then vegetables. So we're talking all seeded items so far, really, or tubers. And going through that, I think this has been presented very interestingly, because each of those were getting a historical context, a cultural context, and sort of the human influence that caused it to go out of favor. And I think that is the through line of all of this, is that human influence element. And I do really like that this is maintaining a hopeful tone, even though it's about extinction, because in many of the cases, the author is wrapping up with human influence in the positive, where seed vaults are giving us a hopeful future, or um, people are trying to revive and resurrect some of these plants or indigenous practices surrounding the growth of certain plants. And so I really, really like that tone aspect. I'm hoping that continues on. Um, but I feel I don't have a ton to say, so this is going to be a very boring vlog because other than the very specific stories of these individual plants that, that are only a couple pages each for the most part, the larger picture about biodiversity and the human influence on biodiversity, I already knew most of that. So I am really going to have to shape how I judge this book as how is the information presented, is it very consumable, and so far it is. Um, rather than like judging based on how much I personally learn or how much is, is takeaway from me. Because so far there's not a lot other than very plant specific information. So um, as I said, I'm about a quarter of the way through, so that's very good progress. So I'm pretty on track to get this one done uh, in time for the deadline. I've got another week and a half <laughs> to get it done before I'm worried. She is also the founder and director of the educational program Rising Star Girls, which encourages middle school girls of all colors and backgrounds. Good evening. I am so excited to be here. I, this is like the coolest space I have ever seen. No pun intended, pun intended. Um, for different types of stars. That's the power of computer modeling. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about that, and then you'll read, hopefully, more about that in the book. What I find really fun about studying exoplanets is turning knobs to figure out how habitable, that is how likely to host life these planets might actually be. Gumbo, come here. I barely touched her and she's completely <laughs> needy. Come on, are you gonna come on my lap? Come here, you can do it. Gumbo, she hasn't even had her drugs today. Gumbo. Girl, you're being so friendly. I don't know what's even going on. 
on. This is so weird. Hi. I can't leave it. All right, Bro is headed back to the shelter. Yeah, I know. It's real hard, isn't it? We are mostly healed up. Bye-bye, Monroe. So it is a big benefit of the fostering process that you have to clean everything. Also the biggest negative of the fostering process. So the floor has been steamed, as has the futon cleaned. Anything cloth, including the rug, has been washed. The um, litter box <laughs> has been emptied and bleached. Um, yeah, <laughs> so Kitty is gone and my room is back to normal. So I have not made a ton of progress on my reading, just still, still slow going, continuing forward. Work has been crazy, the usual. However, I had a good coincidence, a lovely coincidence. I love when that happens between books. In The Face Maker, there is a big chunk currently that's talking about how these different people in different parts of the world are kind of innovating and coming up with the same ideas for new discoveries in plastic surgery. And also at the same time, Eating to Extinction drops something exactly the same, not, not in terms of plastic surgery, but in terms of, of a food innovation that also was independently discovered in multiple places. So I love that. That is something that fascinates me so much. I love the idea of it and how the confluence of, of pressures in the world and conditions that are happening at a certain time can inspire the same innovation at, at exactly the same time from totally separate people who have none of the same uh, conditions in their individual lives but the overall global conditions make the right place and time and situation for it to happen. So I find that topic so wondrous and I don't know, it's it's awe-inspiring to me. So if anybody has any books that actually talk about why that happens, I would love to hear it because I, I'm aware of quite a lot of prominent cases of that happening, but nobody ever seems to talk about what our theories are for why that comes about. And I, I just love hearing about it. So. Nothing really more to say about this one, other than that was just an exciting, fun crossover between my books on that topic. Well, apparently now that the first foster opened the floodgates, we are all about the fosters now. We got two kittens in the bathroom because we've got a goop eye. We have to be able to bleach it. Oh, big hop. Can you hear? Big purrs. Other brother is a little bit shy. He's gonna need some work. Huh. Oh yes, this is sure to be my favorite section. Yet another wild coincidence between my books. The Face Maker had a whole section discussing and walking through the progression of the discovery of blood typing and blood transfusions. Very intriguing because that was in my very first book as well, but in much more depth in The Song of the Self. So I think it was told in a really interesting and concise way here that I, I very much liked. <laughs>
finished Eating to Extinction today. It was very good. No complaints from me about this one. It continues on with the format that I described through the whole book of very short chapters on a different food, plant, animal, whatever type of item. And so it's very difficult for me to wrap this up really in a way that's kind of cohesive because it was so disparate. But what I think it was trying to get across, it was successful at how much human influence has played a part in, in our food, in our move toward homogenizing food. And the things that we've given up, we maybe don't even know. So I think that the thing it was focused on there is all of these heritage products, whether plants or animals, whatever, we have decided to prioritize in most cases volume, proliferation, and calories, things like that in our food sources. And that has led to a lot of homogeneity. But instead, we've let things die off without really having long-term study of what we're losing there, whether it be different forms of hardiness or nutrient density in a lot of cases. That's what we're talking about, things that were much more nutrient dense than the foods that we have in terms of vitamins and minerals. And we're going for just pure calories without as much nutrients too. So. So there's a trade-off and it's not well studied what we've traded off. We've simply just gone full bore for whatever product will, will grow the quickest, the most, and the most calorie dense. And we see the same thing in a lot of prepared foods as well. What proliferates there is also very calorie dense, it tends to be very satisfying foods over necessarily nutrient dense foods. And I think there's some turnaround in that happening. And I think for the same reason. So a lot of people are turning more toward farm to table and slow food. And this does, in the end, <laughs> sort of wrap up to that point of slow food. In fact, let me read a quote here from, I think this was from the actual epilogue. Yeah, so this is him quoting someone else who he's talking to. I'm not saying we should return to being hunter gatherers, but all of us can benefit from getting back something of that relationship with nature. And I think that this built the case over all those loads of tiny chapters about that because so many of the foods that we are being presented with involve specific preparations or specific growing methods that require time and conditions and certain climate and all of those things have had value to either culture which it has a value of its own obviously to nutrients and microbiota or um, our microbiome inside of our gut bacteria and those are things that we're only kind of just figuring out how important they are and learning how integral those are to every aspect of our lives. Um, gut bacteria and culture both are major parts of everyone's life. So those are things that are undervalued in the food industry and in big agriculture and factory farming, obviously. And we've lost a lot of those practices. So I do personally think there is a ton of value in getting across that message. So as I said, very much up front, I'm really biased toward liking this message a lot because I really strongly agree with that. I do think that this maybe didn't, it felt like a brief tour <laughs> through things more so than, than giving us that big picture. I do wish we had kind of come around to a large section at the end with the big picture um, because I don't think at any point the author ever actually talked about how like badly decimated things are at an overall like global scale. In each chapter, he's talking about the individual things that have been sort of lost because of, of these decisions about what plants or animals or food products we prioritize. But I don't think he talked about the larger scale or even the impacts on the environment of these major losses. So I wish we had gotten the broad scale stuff talked about more. I also felt like it was a really random coincidence for me that I read this and loved it and it reminded me immensely of a show that I had just watched, um, Restaurants at the Edge of the World with Kristen Kish, who I love, and that's a National Geographic show. And I feel like a lot of shows like that are trying to lead us toward these sort of practices and that's, this show is very focused on going to very remote places that have these heritage practices that are using local ingredients um, and trying really niche things. And I think there is a desire in the world for that. So, so this book very much feels like it can give you sort of bite-sized episodes, almost like that show that I enjoyed very much. So if that's something that you're interested in, 
I think this is a very natural place to go for that. And it's very entertaining to read as a result because it does sort of feel like a travel show, really, uh, since you're getting watched through and you're getting both the good and the bad. And he does, I think I mentioned, focus on many hopeful things in the end of the chapters about people who are trying to bring these practices back, um, about people who are keeping these things alive and hopefully trying to make these broader in the world so that they're available there to use if we do come into dire circumstances where where things have died off as a result of us only having one type of crop and it getting targeted with an illness or things like that. So I think this was a, a pretty powerful book, yet very, very readable, and something I could hand to somebody that is new to this topic and really doesn't know anything, hasn't really learned about the topic of, of our food sources at all, I think it would be good. Um, probably the main, like the biggest negative that I have for this is in the epilogue, he does talk about slow food and the slow food movement. I'm personally a member of my, my slow food group locally and I follow their events, that sort of thing. But he doesn't really ever actually explain what that is. I don't think, I, I could have totally missed it, it's possible. But I don't think it was really covered. It's just kind of mentioned and put out there and there's no 101 level baseline for here's what slow food is and here's here's why. It's just sort of, there are slow food groups out there and there are people that are pushing this and, and it's important. Um, so, so I do wish there had been a little more explanation of that for a person who feels like they want a direction to go to look for ways to get involved and engaged in this. Um, I also think that, you know, even more than just mentioning slow food, like mentioning ways to get involved with community gardens or community farms would have been a really great thing to also mention that I think was a big thing missing potentially, um, because that is often people's first way to get really directly connected with providing their own food source. And that's how you get people excited about what the food they're eating is rather than just picking up whatever's in their grocery store, right? So very minor, very minor critiques about that. I really thought this was very good. Uh, it's honestly going to be a hard decision to make when I post my uh, rankings on these, which I'm going to have to do very soon. So I do have my one remaining book, The Face Maker, left to go. And I have a very manageable amount left on audio to do tomorrow, I think. I'm not going to try to rush it in tonight, even though I have time. But once I'm done tomorrow, <laughs> then I'll have to figure out my rankings. So I will update you after I finish The Face Maker. With a heavy heart, Gillies confessed. One could have wished that this brave fellow had had a happier death.
getting violent. What are you guys doing? Did it. The two prize semifinals reading is completed. Yay. I finished the face maker, so I think I'm just gonna talk the face maker today and give myself a couple days to think before I come back around and wrap everything up. So for the face maker, I would say first I read it on audio. The audio narration was fantastic. Uh, however, one, one extra special thing to note is the narrator, Daniel Gillies, is the great great nephew, I think. Some, some great ancestor <laughs> or great uh, descendant of Harold Gillies, who is the topic of this book. So that's interesting. And he is also a professional audio narrator. So major coincidence and quite a good one at that. So as far as the book, this is a weird one because it's mostly biography, but not really entirely. It's got big chunks that are military history or medical history. So it's like 75% biography. And that is an outlier in this group totally different from anything else. So it's hard to hold up against these other more broad ranging books. I think as a biography, it's very interesting. Like this is just a good story. Um, you feel compelled and want to hear about this guy's life. He's innovating these amazing surgeries. He is also coming up with the idea and importance of joining with other specialties, not like surgeons were very much siloed at the point where we're, we're thinking of it at this time in World War One, And he was one of several people who understood that they needed the specialization of dentists, of artists even. And I think that was maybe one of the, the coolest parts of this was learning that that dependency and the strength in difference um, in terms of specialization. So he developed a knowledge of these other skills outside his field because he understood the importance of having that sort of specialist knowledge that wasn't just in surgery. The importance of interpreting a face in an artistic way that maybe wasn't an exact copy of what it was before, but understanding the way the face needed to be structured and the building blocks for how you might get there was so important that we hear a lot of stories through this book of, of people spending time doing artistic drawings and depictions to conceptualize and having that process of artistry and the concept before you go in and do it being so important was just not something people had really thought about before. And so it wasn't just the techniques and skills specifically to do with surgeries that he was perfecting. It was a lot to do with how we think about surgery today that he innovated. So I think that was so well laid out. This was just easy to read. This was also the only book that actually was funny. Uh, it's quite gruesome, but very funny at points and has a lot of enjoyable anecdotes from his life where every other book that I read was so heavy. So that was a nice break in, in sort of the flow of what I was reading. It is quite gruesome though. We start off with this big chunk of military history before we're even introduced to Gillies as a person where we're hearing the horrors of war and how terrible World War I was for the soldiers and the disfigurements that they came out from that everything from chemical weapons to explosions. Um, the author has a word that she leans on a lot that's completely obliterated. <laughs> like, that happens a lot. Um, so it's quite graphic. I think this was one of the more graphic and they had some pretty graphic stuff, but this was very, very graphic in detail about how it's depicting what happens to people, um, how it's depicting the smells, the sights, the sounds, everything. So if you can't handle graphic content, this will not be a book for you. I do feel this is probably on the lower end of my books though, not because it wasn't a good book, but because I kind of came out of this with, well, that was a good book. That was enjoyable. But moving forward, I didn't really take much out of it. I, I do feel like I learned a lot about the history of this. And interestingly, one of the, the most important things I think this talked about was kind of just a passing mention almost. At the end, it's discussed the fact that Gillies was the person to do the first phalloplasty on a trans man who was later outed in the 50s, even though he took specific precautions to assure this patient's condition and identity were kept very under wraps. So that was very interesting and it definitely does kind of talk through the case, but I wish we had gotten a lot more of that because it simply 
says to the reader that this here's the context for the case and then the reason why he was this person is because he was doing genital reconstructions on soldiers as a part of his prior work and so that made him a natural person to be interested in doing this and the respect that he had for that and the desire to sort of innovate in that area the fact that he didn't really even think of it as anything controversial himself but knew that it was outside of himself was really on the page so i wish that had been expanded that could be a whole other section of this book and i feel like we, it was very very brief hearing a lot of the historical context for the things that he was innovating was so helpful to understand why these things were so important but i do feel it kind of jumped around a lot and so a big detractor of this, and I didn't necessarily dislike it, but it broke the flow certainly of the biography that we would kind of jump backwards to explore the history aspect at points and take out, take away from the progression of developing plastic surgery techniques. So I think like at one point we were full steam ahead on his beginning to develop these plastic surgery techniques and really get his practice moving forward. He was bringing soldiers to a, a central location where someone sort of hadn't done that before, bring all the same type of, of patient treatments together in one place so they could be focused on by the same team. Um, and then we, we jump back to the impact of, of face masks, which was sort of the precursor to these, these techniques of plastic surgery and people it was about how negative the experience was for people who had to wear masks to go out in public. But that really belonged before that, right? So it felt like it took me out of the flow of the biography. So I definitely felt there was some, some backward and forward jumps in terms of telling this story. It was still a good story. I don't really have any complaints about it. So I think this was yet another really good book. Um, it's gonna be very hard to rank. So I've got, I think, a whole week before my rankings are due in. So I'm going to take a couple days to think through where I want to put things because this is a very tight race in my mind at this point. Um, and then I will come back and give you my official rankings. Every time, kittens always go for the bookshelf. <laughs> what are you doing, little guy? successfully and officially reached the end of booktube prize semifinals. My votes are submitted. I thought about doing it on camera. I decided not to because it was just not very exciting. So we're going to go through the rankings here. If you are jumping in because you didn't want to watch the whole vlog, I don't blame you, but I'm not going to give a full synopsis of every book. So this will be rambly thoughts, overviewing sort of my experience of this couple months of reading and my final rankings. So right up front, I think if you did watch the vlog, you saw I had some very definite preconceptions about these books going in, and the books that I read are here. So I read quite a stack. These are just the print books I also read on audio, The Face Maker. In particular, these three, Eating to Extinction, My Fourth Time We Drown, and The Song of the Cell, were the three that I was the most excited for, and I had it in my mind that they were certainly going to come out on top based on everything that I had heard. And that was not at all how things shook out. And in fact, I really thought I was not going to like Half American as a sort of a military history, and Paradise Falls I hadn't really heard too much about or paid too much attention to, so I really didn't know what I was going into with this one. And those preconceptions were just totally overturned. Um, the Face Maker as well was a real outlier in that it's mostly biography and it was the only one like that in my reading group. So one of the things that I did notice in watching back footage is that I didn't really mention specifically the writing styles of these books at all. And that's because they are very plainly written. I think all of them are really simple to read. They don't use a lot of big terminology. Even the science book I felt was very easy to read and grasp as someone who's not very scientific. So I definitely mentioned that multiple times. So from a, a pure writing standpoint, I think these were all really easy to get into and none of them stood out as being exceptionally uh, well written from a prose perspective, I guess. 
I also didn't really seem to mention the structural aspects. I think I kind of mentioned it as asides, but Song of the Cell is the only book that had very long chapters at all, and they weren't too bad. There were sufficient chapter breaks, definitely, that it was easy to sort of chunk that up, um, and it was split into multiple sections. Most of these books were split into sections with rather short chapters, so quite consumable, I would say, as a reader. Being that we're at the semi-final, the ranking was very difficult because none of the books were actually bad. I think they've been cold enough in earlier rounds that we're down to just actually good books, really. Uh, and so it was very difficult to choose, and especially at the top, it was a hair's breadth away from what was second versus first. So let's get into the ranking then. In last place, I have positioned The Song of the Cell by Siddhartha Mukherjee. This was a very scientific and very dense read, and I think having to read this on a timescale did not assist this book. Uh, I learned a lot regarding very specific details about how the cell works, how it can go wrong, um, how its behavior affects us, and how we are trying to manipulate its behavior as humans. Different ways the cell affects us and ways we try to heal through the cell. So I loved learning all of that, but at the same time, it's so scientific and dense, and I don't feel like it has maybe a, a casual reader audience, even for someone like myself who reads some stuff like that. I just didn't really enjoy reading this, and it felt like it's geared toward more science-heavy readers, yet they would already know all this, I think, or most of it. I also very definitely felt the hand of the author in many cases here, and this was the only book where I actually questioned the motives of the author or the bias of the author in the information or how the information was being imparted about certain topics. So this one was not a bad book. Again, I think this was very easy to read as a non-scientific reader. I think I got a lot out of it. So it was good, but it just didn't live, live up to the rest of the field. So this one is at the bottom. In fifth place, and it breaks my heart to do this, but it's Eating to Extinction by Dan Saladino. I really enjoyed this book. It is taking us through chapter by chapter, individual foods, very short chapters focusing on a heritage food or an ancestral food practice, um, things that are sort of dying away because of how humans have focused on homogenous food um, practices and production in order to produce mass quantities, obviously. And it focuses in on an individual food in each chapter, so this feels like a food travel show. It's We're jumping locations, we're all over the world in these really niche products and ways of producing food. I love the confluence of looking at aspects of, of time and climate and conditions, how things had to be prepared and produced and grown. Um, so it really gave me a lot to take away and enjoyment in terms of those aspects but it didn't really build into something bigger. It didn't talk at a large scale or a long time scale about the effects of these things, of, of losing these things. I do like that the individual chapters mostly remained pretty hopeful in talking about or centering an individual who is trying to keep these heritage items afloat and, and keep them within our world so that we don't lose these things, that we don't even know how we may benefit from, really. I thought this was great, but it just didn't have that larger scale to push it up the list against some of the others, so this one is in fifth. In fourth place, I have The Face Maker, my audiobook. This was a great biography of the surgeon Harold Gillies, who really innovated plastic surgery in World War I to deal with the outcome of disfigurement of soldiers as a result of the war. And I feel like this had an interesting balance between the biography itself and history, military history, medical history, but I do feel like there was sort of a, a two steps forward, one step back in the storytelling because of that, because the history sections seemed like they were either misplaced or sort of a, a jump backwards maybe, and taking up too much time. And the biography was fascinating. It felt very plotty and engaging, really action-packed. Um, we were learning about all these innovations and new inventions that Gillies was coming up with, new ideas for how to cooperate with other fields, and that was all like keeping me completely into this story. In fact, I wanted that part to be even longer, and I felt like the history parts kind of took away from that. So I feel like structurally there maybe was some issue there that could have been improved on, 
But otherwise, this was just plain a good book. I really, really enjoyed reading it and loved hearing the story. Um, again, I listened on audio and the audiobook is narrated by a great descendant of uh, Gillies himself and I thought the narration was fabulous. So I really thought this was something that anyone would be entertained by. I hate to say that because it's so gruesome, especially at the beginning. The beginning takes a little bit of setup in just telling us or showing us how horrific war was at the time. And I felt, again, that was a historical section that seemed too long before we actually ramped up into introducing Gillies. So yeah, so maybe structural issues, but it was a fabulous book and one I could hand to just about anybody. Getting into my top three, all three of these books were incredible books, very challenging topics and important books. Any criticism I can make about these at this point is really just nitpicking. Um, but I'm gonna try and I could have ranked these completely differently any other day really. My first place I do think is pretty solid where it's at. <laughs> but uh, jumping to number three. Number three is My Fourth Time We Drowned by Sally Hayden. This is so harrowing and difficult. It's a look at the refugee crisis and people trying to flee from Tripoli to get to Europe and winding up kicked back into indefinite detention in these horrific conditions in prisons for years and entire families being stuck there. Um, just a mass of human suffering really is what this takes us through. And the reason it's in third place is really because as a nitpick, again, it feels a little repetitive because for 200 pages, we're going through the same story over and over and over from different people in different detention centers, but it's the same story. And I felt there had to be a way to collate that or maybe edit that so it didn't feel so repetitive. Um, I do get the authors probably trying to get across how the mountain of people that were impacted by this, just the mass of, of humans that were having to struggle through this condition. So I get that. I do wish it had maybe spent less time on that repetition and more time on getting us actionable content because that was the hardest part coming away from this for me was that I didn't feel like there was anything I could act on as someone who already has empathy for this topic. I don't know that I needed this book for myself. I think this is an important book that really would be additive to someone who is not familiar with the topic or does not feel empathy for people in this situation. I think this would get that across to them. But as someone who already has that, I, I needed to know who to support, how to support this cause. And I don't feel like I really came away with that. But you did get a lot of information about who's corrupt and why corruption ha happens but I don't have a lot of hopeful direction to come out of this with to make things better. So that one was very journalistic. And my second place book is also very journalistic. It's Paradise Falls by Keith O'Brien. This is a historical account investigation from Keith O'Brien of this massive scandal, a, a corporate true crime story really about a chemical uh, company that dumped waste. They were allowed to do that at the time and then a town was developed over top of it, basically. And the struggle of the people in the, this town to get answers, the health issues that they went through as a result of literally living and playing and working and going to school on top of a chemical waste dump is horrifying. And seeing the ways that these people had to fight to advocate for themselves was so incredible. The, the fight taken to the political level at a grander national scale was something that I wasn't really aware of. And this is happening in the past in a time when the EPA was relatively new. And so seeing that developing organization first becoming involved in something like this was truly fascinating and really added a lot of dimension to this story. So I felt like this was a very important work and because it's really corporate true crime, it is something that feels like it will really tap into a lot of readers. So I don't know how much it has to say that's imminent for us today, other than things we already know about capitalism and the manipulation of corporate crime. But it feels like a really readable and important work to look at our past. And that means my first place book is also a history book that has very strong connections and commentary that's important for us today. And that is Half American by Matthew F. Delmont. This is the story of black soldiers in World War II, the ways they were very, very underestimated, mistreated and dehumanized by our country, by other soldiers and their fellow Americans. And 
it was a difficult read. Very, very powerful reading though. I truly underestimated this book. I thought I was not going to like it because it was military history. And as I said, it's much more sociocultural history, but it is also military history. Um, I, I genuinely thought this was going to be my last place pick and it blew me away. This has so much to say for us today in that it's talking about topics at every level from the individual lives of the soldiers all the way up to the grand scale politics that were happening at the time. And many of the things are very directly connected to things that are happening in the US currently. They're more overt here during this time. Um, it plays out over the entire course of the war. And we, we see the mistreatment of these individuals, both as a single individual of people and as groups in their platoons. So I don't know that this was kind of jumping back to my points about actionability. I don't know that this has directly actionable steps for the reader, but it does give us a real glimpse into the things we did wrong in the past and how we could potentially change those things, why they were wrong for us, the negative effects that they had. That was the sort of analysis that I was kind of missing from other books where we do truly see that there were long-term negative effects to the choices that our country made. And that's the kind of history that's being suppressed in the US in many areas right now. And that's exactly why this book is so important. So I had to make this my first place. This was also the only book to make me cry over the course of this. Amazingly, there's some really difficult reading in here, but this was just so powerful. It moved me incredibly deeply and it feels like the most timely and important story in here. I do also feel like I could hand this to just about anyone and they would get something out of it. So I think this belongs in the final and I do truly hope it moves forward. So I think that's it for Booktube Prize semifinals. Uh, you will be seeing this the week of the semifinals, hopefully, and I will also hopefully have my finals reading assignment and be just jumping into whatever my next books are. So thank you, whether you watch the whole vlog or just my ranking. Uh, it was a great time for me. I hope it was enjoyable for you. Please let me know down below if you've read any of these and if you disagree with my ranking, what do you think should have been on top? I would love to hear it. Thank you so very much for watching.